I'm sure a lot of you guys saw my recent video where I was unboxing this M1 Garand that I got from the CMP. And in that video, I mentioned a lot of things that I still needed to change on this gun so that I could use it for World War II reenacting and have it be accurate to World War II as far as all the parts on it and everything. Stuff like the stock here, the trigger guard, the sight assembly, and a couple other things. Well, one of my subscribers who saw that video actually sent me a package with all the stuff I need for my garage to get it correct to World War II. His name is Patrick and he sent me all of this stuff that you see here. So in this video, I'm gonna go through everything that he sent me and show it to you guys. I didn't even know what some of this stuff was when he sent it to me, but it's pretty awesome. And I'm gonna go through the process of actually putting all those parts on my rifle, which might be easy for some parts and a little more challenging for others, but I guess you'll have to stay tuned to see how that turns out. So how about we get started by just going through all the parts that he actually sent me and pointing out what each thing is. This old field desk from World War II will serve as my workbench for today. So if it looks old and beat up, it's because it is. So the first thing that I have here is a milled trigger guard. So when I say milled trigger guard, I'm just referring to the way that it was produced. So this one here is a milled and this is a stamped trigger guard. If I pop the trigger group out real quick, we'll get a better look at this. So the stamp trigger guard was just stamped out of a piece of sheet metal, and this one was machined instead of just stamped. So who cares and why is that important? Well, these stamped trigger guards weren't used until sometime around April of 1944, meaning that all the rifles produced before then had this milled version. This means that for all the operations that happened before April of 1944, and for even a lot of things afterwards like D-Day, these would have been the most common trigger guard on an M1 Garand. Yes, I know that D-Day happened in June of 1944, so technically there were probably some of these there, but you have to imagine that most of the rifles they used on D-Day hadn't just been produced in the past couple months. So it's safe to assume that the vast majority of people on D-Day had this milled trigger guard on their rifle. And you can see they are visually different. This one is not only a bit thicker and thinner in different areas just because it's manufactured a little differently, it also has this loop on it. This loop was included because if you saw when I took this off of my rifle, you have to kind of bend this piece outward and pull that hook off in order to open this trigger assembly up and pull it out of the gun. That's pretty easy to do with this stamp trigger guard, but this milled part is much stiffer. That means that to pull this one out of the rifle, you often had to put something like a screwdriver through here and pull to exert enough force to bend the trigger guard slightly and pull this out of the rifle. I'll get to putting this onto this trigger assembly in just a minute here, but first let's go through everything else that I got. The next thing that I got was this lock bar sight pinion assembly. So you'll notice that the sights on my M1 right here don't have any kind of lock bar like that. That's because after World War II, these sights were switched out for this kind of sight. I believe it's called the T-105. But those sights weren't developed until 1945. So while you could make the argument that maybe some guns in World War II had these sights put on them all the way at the end, the lock bar sights are almost always more accurate for World War II reenacting. There were a few different types of lock bar sights used in World War II. I believe this one is the Type 2 lock bar assembly. There was also a Type 3 that came after this one and obviously a type one that came before it, but the type two and type three were the most popular ones used in World War II. And with the type two being earlier than type three, this would be accurate for almost any time during the war. The next thing I got was this single slot gas cylinder lock screw. And I actually didn't just get one, I got two of those. So this goes right here on the rifle. You can see I actually have a blank firing adapter on the rifle right now. You can see the opening on this one kind of looks like a plus, whereas this one just has that single slot. As you might have guessed, the story with these is similar to what I've said about some of the other parts. These were the earlier version of the screw that was used, and those ones with the plus on them didn't start being used until the end of 1943. But even once they started putting those plus looking ones on, they still had a bunch of these left over. So they didn't just throw them away. They were actually still putting a bunch of these on rifles until the end of the war. These are still accurate for late war and definitely the accurate choice for early war stuff. 
Next up, we have this. This is called a grease pot normally. This is just a little pot with some grease in it that could be used to lubricate your rifle. But to understand how that was applied to the rifle, let's have a look at this next item that I was sent. On this end of it, we have this screw. And if I open that up, this is just a simple tool that could be used to scoop up some grease and apply it in the little crevices of your rifle. I'll put that back in and then we'll flip over to the other side of this cleaning kit. If we unscrew that, we can see we have a couple things inside. Now that I'm looking down inside this cleaning kit, it's kind of hard to see on here, but I see some uh, what looks like cloth or something in there. I'm gonna try to pull that out with some tweezers to get that out too. And what better place to find tweezers than my surgical kit here? Yep, that looks like a cleaning patch that is as old as the kit. <laughs> So let's have a look at these two things that I pulled out here. You see this piece with the string coming off of it? Let's go ahead and unravel that so we can get a good look at what it is. All right, so we unraveled that string. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom out a little bit so you can see what we're working with. So you can see here we have this metal piece that actually screws apart into two pieces and it's connected by this long string in the middle. The idea for this is this side pretty much just acts as a weight that you can drop down the barrel and this side has this little slot that you could either put a little piece of cloth in, a cleaning patch, or you can screw this little wire brush onto the end and use that to clean out the barrel of your rifle. So the way this works is you drop this down the barrel of your rifle and then you can grab it on the other end and use that to pull this brush through and clean some of the debris out of it. Then once you're done using it, you can wrap this back up, take that in your wire brush and tuck it back inside of this little cleaning kit here. I'm gonna screw this up, put it down next to our grease pot and take a look at the last piece of the cleaning kit. So right here we have the tool. This is actually the combination tool that you can use for cleaning and disassembling the rifle. You can see this interesting piece on the end here. This is actually the shape of the uh, chamber of the weapon. So what you can do is put a cleaning patch in this slot, wrap it around there, and then put this in the chamber of your weapon and twist it around to clean out any debris or residue. In later versions of this tool, this part was replaced by a wire brush at the end, but this is the one that would be correct for use in World War II. Up next, we have this little tool right here. This is just basically a screwdriver that can be used on the various screws on the gun. And as you'll notice, if I pull out that single slot gas screw that we were looking at, it fits right in there so you can unscrew that from your weapon. I'll zoom in on this end where we have some more complex features of the tool. We have this uh, little post right here that can be used to push some pins out of your weapon while disassembling it. We have this little curved piece right here, which actually fits around the rim of a cartridge and can be used to pry a stuck shell out of the chamber. And there's a number of other features on here that can be used to help disassemble other pieces of the weapon. We can actually fit all of this in the weapon itself. So right here, I have the uh, butt plate of the weapon opened up. You can see this hinge part on the plate back here that you can just pry open. And then we have two cylindrical holes right here. So we can take this long skinny cleaning kit and slide it right into that hole. Then we can take our tool right here put that into the top hole and put our little grease pot in behind it and close it up. Oftentimes people would cram some little cleaning patches in here just because one, it's a good place to keep them and two, it keeps the contents from rattling around while you're carrying the weapon. In addition to all of that stuff, he also sent me these two books right here, which will be super useful for just learning a little bit about military techniques and stuff, and learning a little bit more about the rifle that I recently got and how to properly use it. Those will be great resources, and I also have an original copy of the World War II training manual that was used for the M1 Garand. It'll be nice to learn about the weapon in the same way that the soldiers during World War II did. And a fun thing about this copy of the book, it actually still has a soldier's notes from his training in World War II tucked between the pages. Pretty cool. All right, enough yapping. Let's get to actually putting some of this stuff together. Wow, that sounds great. I can't wait to see that, but I gotta interrupt real quick and tell you guys about a book that's coming out that I'm really excited about. It's called Atomic Sunrise, and it's an alternative history book about what could have happened if nuclear war broke out in the 50s, which really wasn't that far off from happening. It's a really interesting concept, and if you're a history nerd like I am, you're gonna love it. 
The book's on pre-order right now and you can go reserve a copy by clicking the link in my bio and you can even use the discount code World War Wisdom for a discount on your purchase. It's been really great of them to support me and I really love the project that they're doing so do yourself a favor and go check it out. It helps support my channel and I think you'll really enjoy it. All right, now let's get some parts on this M1. I'm gonna start by switching out the gas screw here for this single slot one. And what better tool to use than my combination tool? So I'll go ahead and open this up. Then it should be pretty simple to just unscrew this one. When I originally got this rifle, I had to take this uh, gas screw off to get the blank adapter on here. And it was very tight. It took a ton of hard turning to actually loosen it up enough so that it would turn. I don't know why that was, but that's just the way I got it from the CMP. Thankfully now it screws out pretty easily. All right, so I'll pull that one out and it should just be as easy as dropping this new one in and tightening it up. All right, I'm gonna make it tight, but not overly tight. So apply some pressure there and I think we are set. All right, pretty easy first step out of the way and we're one step closer to having a World War II correct M1 Garand. All right, so next up, why don't we install these lock bar sights instead of our post-war sights that we currently have on the weapon. First step here will just be to unscrew this to take it off. So now that I took this off, it's pretty simple to see the comparison between these two assemblies and this one obviously we have that lock bar on it. So now I have to actually remove this from the assembly. Right, so I unscrewed the lock bar itself. Whoa, okay. Yeah, that kind of pulled right off. So now I'll go ahead and insert that back through the assembly here. Everything's a little loose and sloppy in there right now. So I've pulled this little spring and detent out of this part of the knob and I'll go ahead and screw this on to the exposed screw over here. I can now put this little detent back in there and then screw on the lock bar. All right, we have our lock bar sight on the weapon, and I think we're good to go. So now that I have it on here, let me show you a little more of how this lock bar assembly actually works. So as you can see, I unlock the lock bar, then I am free to turn these screws here. Same with the one on the other side for the elevation. Then I can go ahead and lock it back in place without worrying about losing my zero. All right, so this is probably the most involved process that I'll do here. The last two steps were pretty simple, and I think this one will be a little more complex, but it shouldn't be too bad either. And that'll just be replacing the stamped trigger guard with this milled one right here. So to start off, I have to uh, release the hammer. It's in the cocked position. So I should be able to just kind of pull the trigger and ride that hammer forward. There we go. Now I need to punch this pin out. Uh, and to do that, I'm gonna take some pressure off of it by squeezing the sear and the trigger back here. Let's see if I can get a good grip on that. Alrighty. Hopefully I caught some of that on camera. I was kind of struggling with it. Uh, I got the pin part way out, but it was under a lot of pressure. And then I had to squeeze it and I actually used the rim of this casing right here to uh, hook around the back of the pin and kind of pull that out. And you can see the second pin here kind of just fell out once there wasn't any pressure on it any longer. So now I'm going to pop this out. This is the safety mechanism here. So after taking that off, it should be pretty simple to slide this over and off that side of the trigger assembly. Now we just have to put it back together. So I'll go ahead and take this and slide it on the same way I just took that one off. Now I can go ahead and put my safety back in there. 
and that should just drop in and pop back into place. Just line that hole up right here, and push it in, make sure that it functions. Boom, easy peasy. All right, next up, I can take this and pop it back in where it needs to be. Just rest in there just like that. Can't forget about the trigger itself. I'll need to just drop that back into place. You can see how it kind of hooks in there. I'll go ahead now and put this pin back in the way it was. I guess I should do that before I put this assembly in. Let's see if I can actually figure out how to get this back in without causing everything to get flung by the spring across the room. All right, I have the pin in the bottom there so I can push it in with my finger. I'm gonna try to squeeze this uh, spring in and then push that pin through. So I'm kind of pushing the pin and wiggling the trigger and sear just to get it right into the position where I need it. There we go. Let's put it back in the rifle. And now it'll be really easy to just take this and put it onto my rifle. Boom, there we go. I'll do a quick function test just to make sure everything works and I didn't mess anything up too bad when I took it apart, but we should be good to go. Thanks for sticking with me through that guys. My M1 is now complete with this single slot gas screw, lock bar sights, and a milled trigger guard. All that's left to do now is put a World War II stock on it. The stocks in World War II were this darker shade. Uh, this one was clearly replaced at some point after the war. I recorded this a while ago and I'm just getting around to editing it. And since then I've actually gotten a World War II era stock to put on the rifle. Shout out to my friend Brendan for giving me that stock. That was really cool of him. I could pull that out in the video and show you, but I think it'd be much better if I show you these pictures of me using the rifle at a recent World War II reenactment. I've used my M1 at a couple events now and I've had a bunch of fun with it. Here's a little clip of me actually putting it into action. If you want to see more videos like that, I've been posting them on my page and I have a ton more that I'm still editing. So make sure you subscribe to World War Wisdom to check that out. Man, look at how beautiful that thing is. The new stock really does tie everything together and it's back to looking the way it did when the receiver was made in December of 1942. Patrick, thank you so much for sending me all those parts. It was such a big help to a new gun collector like me to have somebody send me all of that. You sent me stuff that I didn't even know that I needed. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I think that pretty much wraps it up for this video. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comments section. I try to read through all the comments on my videos. But other than that, thanks guys, and I'll see you in the next one.